Okay, so thank you so much for, for inviting me and giving me the opportunity to present some of my research here at this wonderful conference. Um, I'm very sad that I could not follow uh, most of the discussions because my, my French is <laughs> not very good. Uh, and uh, I also want to uh, Thanks so much, Dr. Udin, for her fascinating, uh, marvelous uh, presentation. And hopefully we can talk about some of the issues. If, if not now, then uh, another day. So to go to the topic of my paper. So originally I was thinking to present uh, a specific case uh, about participatory photography in Nepal, but when I was uh, scrolling through your uh, conference program, so somehow I got the feeling that perhaps it might go into too much of a detail uh, and it might be better for me to talk about uh, uh, from a little bit broader perspective, because most of the presentations were dealing with arts, you uh, know, in a, in a uh, not from this kind of participatory research uh, perspective. And I was thinking that this uh, way I could try to relate uh, more closely to the overall topics. But let's let's see how it goes. So, in the in the presentation, so I first. Uh, mm, uh, I hope that the slide has changed now. Mm, no. Uh, yeah, this is now. No, the pro it didn't. But it it was uh, previously when you change. Uh, okay, so slide. perhaps I'll do like this. Sometimes it works better yes. when yeah, when when you it when works. you then don't uh, have the full screen. <laughs> yeah. Mm, Perfect. We have the yeah. second. Yeah. <laughs> so. So I was thinking that first I could say a few words about my background and the projects that I've been working on and how arts uh, and decolonizing and resistance is related to it. Uh, and then uh, go in more detail about art based methods in, in social scientific research. So uh, to to start with my own background, so I'm working at the Arctic Circle. I come from a very small northern uh, uh, village in in the northern Finland, and uh, yeah, we got snow two days ago, so we are heading for the winter. And I think that my my perspective from from this uh, area towards the world uh, uh, comes from from the fact that. Uh, the, why I became a resistance studies scholar or why I became interested in South Asia was because of uh, uh, the struggles of the indigenous Sami communities here in the north. So the context, even though they are very different, uh, so there are some similar characteristics like uh, that uh, the Sami indigenous uh, communities are fighting uh, to, to gain their self-determination uh, uh, and uh, they're fighting settler colonialism and somehow these uh, like uh, processes and practices, violent pro processes and practices uh, are quite similar in some of the contexts where I worked later and, and somehow they resonate also with my <laughs> interest in resistance studies. So, uh, I did my PhD in 2010 uh, on the anti-war movement, and uh, I was uh, um, considering also art-based forms of resistance uh, during that time, and became interested in how art was used uh, in, in uh, opposing the Iraq war. Uh, but uh, this time, uh, I was not still into the kind of uh, ethnographic uh, methods that I became uh, acquainted with later. Uh, <clears throat> and arts here at the northern parts of the world, so it's also a very powerful tool for uh, all kinds of protest and cultural heritage uh, and uh, it's been utilized. We have a faculty of arts that has uh, done a lot of uh, research on, on uh, different forms of, uh, 
arts as a way of resisting and way of protesting and uh, and I was working after my PhD in the Faculty of Arts uh, for, for a short while and in, at this Institute of Northern Culture, uh, which gave me sort of an inspiration for, for these kind of themes. So then how, how it all went uh, to the South Asian context, there was two projects that were funded by the Academy of Finland. Uh, they were both dealing with development issues. So the biopolitics of development and security, and then one of my own projects about the development induced displacement in South Asia. And uh, we and us, uh, we were studying uh, uh, struggles against uh, forced evictions and slum demolitions. And uh, I had the opportunity to, to do some field work in Kolkata. Uh, I stayed there for six months and also in Kathmandu. And, and later on with one of my PhD students, we also uh, did some field work in, in Dhaka, in the Coral Slum and in this Beribat Slum. Uh, in, in Kolkata, the struggle was about people who became displaced uh, by this uh, project that was called New Russia Hut uh, Project, Town Project. Uh, 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 so like hundreds of families of peasants were displaced uh, from their lands uh, in order to build this uh, high-rise uh, apartment buildings and new shopping malls uh, in the area. And these people were not compensated properly. Their lands were grabbed actually very forcefully. Uh, and later when, when the lands were in the hands of the developers, the prices went thousand times higher. And uh, people were struggling there against uh, the West Bengal government uh, and the uh, way it connected with the developer's interest. And uh, I had uh, opportunity to work with some leftist movements there. Uh, and uh, yeah, I've written uh, about this. Uh, I, I, I can share later some of those so journal articles and so. And then the other uh, struggle that I was uh, able to to engage uh, in or with was uh, slum dwellers, this kind of young uh, uh, squatters movements representatives in, in Kathmandu who were also uh, collaborating with women's rights activists uh, uh, and this uh, organization called Vorak. And uh, they also were utilizing, uh, they were actually suffering from similar dynamics of neoliberal development and, and uh, state repression uh, being under the threat of eviction uh, all the time and also due to tourism related and also some re religion re related uh, projects. And, and they were also utilizing uh, various ways of, of, of protesting and dissent. Uh, for example, street theater on, on this Monday Tarnas, which they stage uh, regularly. I think for several years they gathered on every Monday to protest on, on this uh, one street, which was really effective, uh, bringing visu visually uh, their demands to the public. Uh, and here's a few photos from then from Bangladesh. So where me, I uh, we were visiting uh, with my PhD student Afroza Khanam, uh, uh, and uh, were also uh, interviewing uh, both uh, slum dwellers and organizations that were working with the urban poor, and uh, also some some experts, for example, uh, transnational. Uh, Oh my God, goodness, um, TIB. Transparency International. Yeah, 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 I guess so. Yes, <laughs> so so uh, 
to find out how the situation in the in the in this big Islam in in Dhaka were and what kind of resistance and what kind of uh, agency the the uh, uh, people were doing there. There are lots of mutual aid projects and a lot of self help groups, which were struggling against these uh, evictions and and the inhuman treatment of the slum dwellers. And so this kind of ethnographic work, which I was then conducting in after my PhD, so it sort of led me to think about, of course, the like the the role of uh, um, different forms of uh, how to engage with uh, communities in that kind of situations and how to be able to take part in 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 solidarity with some of the struggles. So uh, as a result of some of these uh, uh, thinkings and debates and discussions, so with some of my colleagues here at the University of Lapland, so we edited this book on art-based methods for decolonizing participatory research. And uh, we were uh, a group of people who uh, experienced similar problematics in, in different uh, parts of the world, uh, trying to, to to come to terms with our responsibilities as researchers and to to critically examine our the whiteness and and the the dominance of western epistemologies and and research methods and also to connect to this arctic where we are living uh, and how also the sami uh, indigenous people are being researched uh, and uh, just to say a few words about decolonizing, of course, I think during this conference, you must be talking about it <laughs> in, a, in a very several levels. But uh, yeah, it's a bit of a problem that it has become sort of a metaphorized term and so sort of very trendy concept, which is used perhaps too easily without thinking about the, the actual material uh, uh, requirements for for that kind of decolonizing that uh, most of the decolonial scholars are speaking about. And here, for example, uh, a colleague of mine, Cyan Day, who interviewed uh, Professor Roberto Hernandez, uh, was uh, really much emphasizing how we need to have conceptual clarity. What are we actually decolonizing from? And that we need to fight this kind of demetaphorization uh, of the, uh, or we have to uh, aim for demetaphorization of decolonial, uh, decolonial decolonizing. <clears throat> and obviously, like, uh, what's, there is much to, to be said about the the um, connection between post-colonialism and decoloniality, which are different things. Uh, and uh, it's sometimes uh, in the Western discussion, it's sort of forgotten that they come from very different uh, uh, contexts, like uh, this uh, post-colonial theory originates from South Asia and from that context and this decolonial uh, debates uh, from Latin America mostly. And there are some differences which do not go very well together. And uh, there's a lot of interesting debates on about that as well. But nevertheless, the aim is to, to do something differently uh, from this uh, Eurocentric Western dominated perspective and provide alternative ways uh, to think about and do things. And, and Linda Tufi Hervai Smith, of course, is one of the really central scholars here, also in the Arctic context where the Sami indigenous people are living. Uh, so yeah, in here, as well as in so many parts of the world, uh, indigenous people have been sort of a object of uh, extractive practices and appropriation. And it's no wonder that people therefore uh, do not consider research in very, uh, yeah, they yeah, do not necessarily want to take part in research uh, 
by Western scholars or even local scholars who are aware of the context because there is this like very brutal history. And this concerns especially development studies, which I sort of consider one of my one of my fields, uh, even though I am IR background originally. So I've been working more mostly in development studies recently, five, six years. So uh, for example, Olivia uh, Ruta Zipva, so she has talked about this colonial bathwater uh, in, in development research and, and asked that whether we can even hold on uh, to the field of development studies because it's so, so uh, full of uh, this kind of uh, fantasies of superiority uh, and it's built on this idea of, of, of violent universal universality that uh, perhaps we should get rid of uh, development studies altogether and and she's emphasizing that in order to demethodologize uh, de-silence and anti-colonially decolonize uh, we need to focus on 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 questions of ontology epistemology and normativity and here i am thinking about the uh, the role of epistemology because I'm talking about the research methods that can uh, then be somehow or must be transformed in order to, to do this. And uh, I've been working with a, a decolonial feminist scholar of mine, Sara Motta, who, who, who is uh, located at the University of Newcastle. And she has really much uh, similar uh, theorizations and discussions like uh, Chandra Mahanti, Talbot Mohanty, and uh, about uh, the way in which uh, we need to centralize the experiences of those people whose history has been considered marginalized or they've been sidelined or ignored and to, to focus on, on this kind of uh, uh, ways of creating knowledge together. So there are many things that we need to consider in a radically different way. Um, and obviously all this also draws from Spivak's uh, uh, discussions on, on the subaltern and, uh, and it's, it's like here also in the Sami context that it's not about the inability of the subaltern to speak, but the unwillingness of those who are culturally dominant to listen. And if this goes into the research uh, and we consider, consider the people that we are working with as the unfortunate other, uh, so uh, then we are already in deep trouble. Uh, here also the questions that are related to intersectionality to play a role. So in order to, to do something differently, we should actually try not to, to, ha to have this kind of distance, but uh, rather uh, to do uh, things in more collaborative and intimate way uh, and try to to construct these relations of power in a different way, even it's not possible to totally erase erase uh, any power relations. Uh, but we have to to try to somehow um, challenge the presumption that uh, the researcher has the epistemic privilege in producing theory. That also <laughs> the research participants they they can create theoretical knowledge and also we have to consider whose and what knowledge is important uh, and then <laughs> to come to the the art based method so uh, in the book and and in some of the discussions that uh, are sort of uh, ongoing now so it has been argued uh, that uh, art based methods can provide some some uh, potential for transforming these kind of uh, relations of power, uh, at least on some levels. And uh, 
what is art-based methods then? So there's obviously visual art and audiovisual art and, and all these uh, multi-method forms, as well as performative arts. Uh, and we can consider also all kind of poetic inquiry and, and storytelling, songwriting, screenwriting to be uh, part, uh, parts of those metal cavalcades. And uh, when you use art-based uh, methods in, in research, so there is uh, so many different ways to actually utilize them. They can be utilized in the data collection and co-production of knowledge, but also in your own interpretation and analysis. When you can, for example, uh, write a poem about the research data or do uh, collective poetry together, uh, uh, but also in dissemination, uh, it can be utilized. Uh, and uh, uh, here's one example of, this is a photographic collage that I did uh, for uh, one conference about the results, uh, research results in India and, 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 and Nepal about the the neoliberal development projects displacing people. It's just a one example of how I consider that art based methods can be used in dissemination of results as well. Um, but then when it's used for uh, collecting or co-producing the material, then I could use as an example this uh, photography thing uh, that uh, we did in, in Nepal. So this was something that came from the, the uh, participants and, and the people that I was engaging. They said that perhaps we could do something together to discuss and get to know each other better and to learn about from other from the other activists as well. So we did this uh, uh, kind of a, a workshop where we first discuss what we want to to photograph and uh, and it was uh, decided that we, the, the photographs would deal uh, about the daily lives, but also about the activism of these young women in in uh, in Kathmandu mostly. And uh, uh, then after uh, having these first initial discussions, everybody uh, Take, took their photos and then we developed them and we had this uh, kind of workshop where we were talking about them uh, and and to to learn about the struggles and and the ways of people wanted to tell about their activism and uh, I in this paper that I'm referring here I'm discussing it as a as a form of decolonial feminist solidarity. Uh, and you can read more about the, the feminist solidarity part in, in the paper, but I just wanted to use this uh, example here to, to illustrate that uh, how knowledge uh, can be produced together and how uh, it can be also considered as, a, as, a, as, as, as knowledge, but also arts. Uh, one of the organizations, they, they had an artistic... Uh, exhibition at their own facility uh, they wanted to uh, display the photos uh, for everybody to see and, and to continue the discussions but we decided that we would never uh, publicize this in any research publication so they could uh, they could use it as in their in their own community building and and for their own purposes Tina, just for information, you have three minutes left. Okay, sure. Thank you. So just to, to then say something about what do, what do I consider as the benefits or, or the opportunities of art-based methods in, in this kind of participatory research. So, yeah, these uh, forms of... Uh, Make, doing things together. So I think that the, the best thing about it is that it sort of uh, allows both the researchers and the participants to, to think and engage and experience uh, in a different way. Uh, and 
it, they should always be uh, uh, sort of designed in a way that it will support the perspectives of the communities. And so they have to be designed together uh, and, and have to be steered by this moral commitment uh, that there should be some value, some benefit for the, the participating communities. This may enable more horizontal relationships uh, and, and, and the creation of, of, of reflection and collective problem solving in dialogue uh, together. And it might uh, also uh, help to, to visualize some of the knowledges that have been sort of uh, sidelined. Uh, and uh, at least it can uh, challenge the kind of theoreticism uh, and centeredness on expert knowledge uh, in many ways. Uh, there are also some, some other potential benefits, uh, like how it can, for example, uh, help to envision new ways in which we create connections, reciprocity and care, and, and to, to produce this kind of very different forms of knowledge, uh, not just uh, written, but also embodied or visual. Uh, but at the same time, we must be aware of the limitations and the challenges, and especially the risks that using our based methods can also create new power hierarchies, and uh, at worst, uh, they can also uh, recolonize. So we never must forget that. And that, and also that uh, it is not everybody who wants to uh, really uh, is able to or comfortable of using our based methods. And this has to be taken into consideration as well. Um, yeah, I have lots to say, but so <laughs> not much, not much time. Uh, but I, I, I sort of wanted to to broaden a little bit of the the perspective. I hope it worked. <laughs> uh, otherwise, I could talk easily one or two hours about the the photography project in Nepal. But I'm thinking about perhaps a bit broader perspectives on how we can try to transform these very Eurocentric uh, research methods and perspectives into a bit more, uh, yeah, a bit more something that uh, can transform the usual, uh, uh, yeah, the usual practices. And yeah, in the end, uh, yeah, I, I, I'll just leave uh, leave this poem <laughs> uh, from from uh, uh, from India. Uh, this is indigenous people who are uh, who have uh, protested against uh, being treated as uh, as data. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> thank, thank you. you.